thank you. I'm, I'm going to talk about, uh, eventually I'll get to the video game industry, but I'm going to, I'm going to talk about how the experts are, are always wrong, or almost always wrong, and why you really need to have convictions in your own, in your own uh, uh, thoughts. I'm going to uh, talk really fast because I know I'm between you and a cocktail right now. So let's, let's get going here. Whoops. Let's get going here. I'm flying. Thank God. Um, uh, oh, excuse me. I'm screwing up here on this. Okay. I'm flying. Heavier than air flying machines are impossible, said Lord Kelvin, president of the Royal Academy of Sciences in 1895. On telephones, that's an amazing invention, but who would ever want to use one of them, said President Rutherford B. Hayes. And, you know, I guess our presidents are prone to say crazy, crazy things like that. On large-scale computers, maybe there is a world market for five computers, said Tom Watson, the founder of IBM, not that long ago, 1943. On personal computers, even more recently, there's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home, said Ken Olson, founder and chairman of Digital Equipment, which used to be a very important uh, personal computer company. And my favorite is on Apple. There is no hope. Steve should shut it down and return any money in the company to the shareholders, said Michael Dell in 1997 when asked what Steve should do with Apple when Steve returned to the company. And I think as most of you know, today Apple is worth 63 times what Dell is worth. <clears throat> so I'm going to walk you through my life real quickly on some of the brands that I've been involved with and why things that people told me to do just wouldn't have worked. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll use a few examples here and there. So I started my career in a subsidiary of J. Walter Thompson in New York City, and one of our clients was Miles Laboratories, and they had a vitamin called Chalks, which was a chewable Chewman's vitamin, uh, it was along with their one-a-day vitamins. And the business went to hell literally overnight because a competitor brought out multi-flavored, multi-colored sha animal-shaped vitamins. And so they asked us, come up with a new vitamin idea. And we did all this research, and we went back out to Elkhart, Indiana, and we said, okay, you got to do Flintstones vitamins. And they said, get out of here. It just went off primetime TV. All of our media experts, all of our marketing consultants say, you can't do Flintstones vitamins. Go do more research. So we did. We came back and said, you got to do Flintstones. Even though it went from primetime to Saturday morning, the kids and the moms want it. So they said, okay, if you come out here and work on this brand, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. You don't have any better ideas. So a group of us went out to Elkhart and we did the packaging and the product plan and, and in six months we introduced Flintstones vitamins to the world and it became the number one chewable vitamin in the, in the industry uh, and it still is today. So what are the lessons? Well, obviously moms wanted a chewable vitamin for their children because their children weren't getting the right nutrition from fruits and vegetables because they weren't eating them. And the media experts were clearly wrong. They didn't know what they were talking about. And Saturday morning TV was certainly a very powerful way to reach that, that audience. Moving on, I was hired out of there by Mattel. I initially worked on preschool toys, CNCs, Jack in the Boxes, Tough Stuff, what have you. One day, Ruth Handler, the CEO and founder of Mattel, walked in my cubicle, which was right outside the ladies' room. I got a lot of business there. And said, uh, hey, Tom, the Barbie business just declined for the first time ever. 1973, it declined to $42 million. My retail buyers say it's over, they won't buy any more Barbie. My sales force says it's over, they can't sell Barbie. The Wall Street analysts say it's over for Barbie, you should go on to something else. What do you think about all that? And I said, Ruth, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Barbie will be around long after you and I are gone. She said, that's what I wanted to hear. You're now the product director and marketing director on, on Barbie. So I asked her, I said, what is it about Barbie that makes her so special? And Ruth said to me, with Barbie, a girl can imagine being anything she wants to be. And I took those words to heart. I used them in advertising and on packaging for the next 15 years. I also did some things to the product line. I put all the products in pink packaging. And I, did, I segmented the, the line in many different ways. We did very young product for, for young, young girls, two and three year olds. We did my first Barbie, just Velcro snaps and little snaps on it to dress the doll. I did a very inexpensive doll because at the time Ideal Toys had brought out Dawn fashion dolls and they were eating our share of market. So I did a promotion. For $3 you can get a new Barbie doll, but you got to trade in your Dawn doll. And everybody did. And I also did very expensive 
Oscar de la Renna fashions on Barbie, and Bob Mackie fashions, and House of Chanel fashions, and Billy Boy from Paris fashions on Barbie and charged $100 for those. These were not for little girls, these were collectors. And we always did occupation dolls. We started doing occupations back in the early 70s. In 1976, we did President Barbie. Uh, we did Astronaut Barbie, Dr. Barbie, what have you. Last year, they did uh, uh, President Barbie again, and they did Entrepreneur Barbie. The only occupation that never seemed to sell was uh, Lawyer Barbie. <clears throat> and all, we'd, all, every year, we'd bring out a new house, because after all, it's a hardware software model. If a child has hardware, a big house, they have to fill it with software, dolls, high margin, furniture, high margin, costumes, far, far, far mar, high margin. And last year, I noticed the, the company, the Barbie had been declining in sales the last three years. They had walked away from this phrase, with Barbie, you can be anything you want it to be. But last year, they brought out different shapes of, for Barbie, so that a girl who, of whatever shape could imagine, more easily imagine being Barbie. And, the, and I noticed that the first quarter of this year, the Barbie sales were actually up, even though last year's sales were, were down the first quarter, they were, they were up. So, so today, the average retailer has 48 feet. Uh, the lessons are market segmentation by all different ways really works. Own your own retail space, 48 feet of pink really works. Uh, have broad a appealing positioning, you can be anything you want to be. And, uh, and reflect current adult trends, which we always tried to do, and certainly a hardware software model. Uh, you may not know, when I, when I started on Barbie, it was 42 million. When I turned it over to Jill Barad, it was 550 million. She grew it to uh, over a billion. And today, it is still a billion dollar brand. Uh, it's over 75 million dollars are sold each year. 1.5 are sold each, each second. And the average girl owns 10. And clearly, the experts were, were wrong on that. I became president of Mattel. And we didn't have a male action line. Hasbro had Star Wars and G.I. Joe. We, didn't, we had Big Jim, which wasn't really selling very well. And so again, I returned to research and researched every theme conceivable to what should we do? Should we do superheroes? Should we do another space line? Should we do a military theme? Should we do cops, firemen? What should we do? And this strange looking guy, this fantasy figure, He-Man and his enemy Skeletor won in the, in the research. And so we, after the research, we introduced the line and it became a $75 million line. So it wasn't, it wasn't insignificant, but the chairman of the company came in my office one day and he said, well, it's nice, but you'll never be important because you don't have a TV show and you don't have a movie and you can't get one. And I said, you want to bet? And so we invested with Group W, we each invested three and a half, roughly million dollars. We hired Filmation Animation to develop an animated television show. We did 65 half hours. We gave them away free to every station in the country, every local station. So whether we were in San Francisco, San Jose, Tucson, or Kansas City, we gave the show away. Why? We got advertising spots back in return. And it turned out that the show rated so highly that those advertising spots, which we then sold to McDonald's and Kellogg's and others, and sometimes we used them ourselves, had such a high price on them, we ended up making a profit off of the television show. And oh, by the way, the toy line increased to $750 million in, in revenue from our sales, but we had licensing revenue of another $250 million from comic books and books and posters and shoes and pajamas and you name it. So it was a billion dollar brand, and we're talking about back in the early 1980s, so that's probably in today's dollars a several billion dollar brand. So the lessons, research really can create great products. Persistence, again, overcomes negativity. It was the first time that a toy company had produced a successful television show. After that, we did lots of television shows. We did She-Ra, Princess of Power. We did uh, Popple's television show. We did Rainbow Bright, lots of different television shows. And it became the model that every toy company used from then on. Hasbro's taken it to an extreme form of art where they do it on everything they have. So later on, I was hired by Sega, by the chairman of, of Sega, whom I knew from my, my Mattel days. And, uh, and everybody thought, oh, and by the way, I, I think you met, uh, Shannon mentioned, there is a book out. This was a bestseller on the New York Times uh, business books section a year ago in February. And a documentary film is being shot, and a, and a feature film is being written by Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg and Scott Rudin, who produced Moneyball, Social Network, uh, Captain Phillips, Budapest Hotel is going to produce it, Sony's going to distribute it, and I have no idea who's going to play me. But anyway, the whole story of what happened at Sega is in there, so I can't cover it all. But basically, 
My friends and the Wall Street analysts all said, why would you go to Sega? Why would you do this? Nintendo has 95% share of the market, and they have Mario, and Sonic, Sega has Shinobi, and nobody's heard of it. Uh, but the deal I made with the chairman was, because I knew that Japanese companies tend to try to manage things very tightly themselves, was I had to be able to make the decisions for the United States marketplace and had to do things a little bit differently than they were doing them. The Sega business, by the way, at the time when I came into it was a $72 million business. So I went back to Japan and with the board of directors I said, okay, here's the things you got to do. We're going to lower the hardware price from $200 to 149 We're going to develop more U.S. software in Redwood City. And we're going to do sports titles. We're going to do American licenses. Uh, we're going to do movie licenses. And we're going to do role-playing games that are for an older age group. Uh, we're, going to we're going to put our best title in with the hardware, which would look like it was going to be Sonic the Hedgehog. And we're going to take on Mario. We're going to make fun of Nintendo. We're going to go after the teen and college market and we're going to attack Nintendo in advertising. Uh, and we're going to position Nintendo as the little kid's toy. We're going to leave them the 9 to 13-year-old market. We're going to go after the 15 to 21-year-old market. Well, the board of directors in the board meeting room in Japan said, you're basically, a, you're crazy. And they, they used a lot of language that I can't repeat. Uh, you know, if you put the best software title in, you're taking that profitable software title away. If you lower the price, we're not going to make any money. Who ever heard of taking on a large company like Nintendo? That's foolish. You can't do that. On and on and on. And the chairman got up to leave the room, and uh, he turned at the door, and he said, well, nobody here agrees with anything you just said, but I promised you you could make the decisions for the U.S. market, so go ahead and do what you've outlined. So we did. And uh, it was a huge, huge success, by the way. And the Sonic team liked what we were doing in the US so much, they moved to the US. And so Sonic 2 was developed with a joint Japanese and, um, and American team and became the best selling product that, that Sega had. We launched it on Sega Tuesday. And you might note that all video games today, if they're console related, are, are released on Tuesday. We had it in every store in the United States, 20,000 outlets the same day, the same hour. People, that had never been done before. People said, how'd you do that? Emory Air Freight. Anyway, uh, a lot of aggressive advertising on the welcome to the next level idea and the Sega scream. I won't bother to show you that, that advertising. Um, I'll try not to anyway. So one quick story. I grew up at Mattel. I knew Sam Walton. I knew everybody in Walmart senior management and they wouldn't buy Sega products. It really hurt my feelings. And after being turned down for the third time, you ever been to Bentonville, Arkansas? I went out to the main road, Highway 41, turned right, and there was a strip mall, and there was an empty store. And I rented that store and put a big sign up front that said, come play Sega video games for free. I bought every billboard in and out of Bentonville, Arkansas. I bought all the radio and television time in Bentonville, Arkansas. Down the road is the University of Arkansas. I bought the seat cushions, and on one side had printed Sega in big letters. On the other side, it was a, it was a different color, so when they held them up, it said different things in the stadium. And, and then every week, I would call the VP, Rick, last week at Target, we outsold Nintendo by 20%, and at Toys R Us, we outsold them by 35%. Thought you'd want to know. Click. Soon, he called back and said, stop it. My board gets the point, stop it. We'll buy, we'll give you four feet of Sega Genesis in Walmart stores. And it grew from four feet to 16 feet to 32 feet. And we did pass Nintendo in share of market at Walmart as well. So anyway, some of the things that we did first for the industry, remember when I started in the video game industry, it was about a two and a half billion dollar industry. Today, you heard Shannon talk, it's a hundred billion dollar industry. Why is it a hundred billion dollar industry? because it's no longer a 9 to 13 year old age group that's playing it. It's everybody. Sony says the average age of their player today is 31. Well, I think we started that. We went after teens and young adults. We started doing more, frankly, more mature games. We established the rating system for video games. We established the E3 show. Uh, we did crazy things. We did mall tours where we'd compare 
Super NES versus Genesis and ask people to play them both and see which they like best. We won 82% of the time in the malls across the country. We had a kid on every college campus who was a Genesis player. And he would, all he had to do was, we'd send him free software, he had to, all he had to do was talk it up on the college campuses. Anyway, lots and lots of stuff that we did first. We did a, a cable uh, channel where you could uh, play, for $15 a month, you could play 20 different Sega video games, your choice, and we'd change, we'd rotate them in and out for the next uh, year. That was quite, a, quite an achievement in, in 1994, by the way, when every console box in the country, cable box in the country was a different uh, hardware uh, configuration. Sega sales grew from, as I said, 72 million to about a billion and a half here in the US and about another billion in Europe. And again, this is back in the 90s, so that would be worth a lot more. Today, the entire video game business grew, obviously. New competitors came in. Uh, quite, a, quite an interesting experience. I was hired out of, of oh, the lessons. We changed the market. I talked about all this. And uh, you know, we were cool. We were the brand to be with. Uh, and Sonic, of course, became a mega franchise. Still is today. The Sonic TV, we did a network TV show and we did a syndicated TV show. They've since done a, a newer uh, syndicated show. So we certainly did a lot of guerrilla marketing. I was hired out by Mike Milken and Larry Ellison. You might have heard of them. And they each invested $250 million. And the idea was to use technology to improve education. And I was really on this. I mean, I thought that video game technology, I still think that video game technology can really improve education. And so I liked this challenge. And over the next, uh, uh, you know, this was our, our, our mission, was to improve education for all ages. And we started 18 companies from ground zero. You might have heard of some of them. K-12 was a, became a charter, charter school curriculum company, trades on the NASDAQ, has about an $800 million market cap today. Uh, knowledge Beginnings. Uh, 3,000 preschools across the United States, owns Kinder Care, uh, became the largest chain of preschools across the United States. Uh, some of you we haven't heard of, Teacher Universe, we taught teachers how to use technology. KU Kids, you probably haven't heard of. But we also bought 18 companies when they were small. We bought LeapFrog when it was doing 3 million in revenue and we grew it to, uh, to 680 million. We brought two IT training companies, one in the US, one in Europe. Spring in Europe became the largest IT training company in Europe. So by 2005, when Larry and Mike, after nine years, wanted their investment returned to them, we returned companies who had revenue well over $2 billion, and the market value of those companies was exceptional. Uh, one quick story on that, LeapFrog, again, when we started LeapFrog, all of the Wall Street analysts said, the ex education doesn't sell. Mom says she wants education and products, but she won't pay for it. So you're wasting your time. We didn't believe that. We used Stanford University professors, in fact, the, the dean of the Graduate School of Education at Stanford and several professors over at Berkeley really created the curriculum that we had for ages two through six. And we built that curriculum, whether it was for reading skills or math skills or science, into products and made that curriculum fun and interesting. And that's why, in my opinion, the company grew from nothing to about 680 million. Um, we're the only company, only education company, that has a scope and sequence for children of that age. Even Pearson and McGraw-Hill don't really have a scope and sequence for children that, that young. Anyway. Moving on, lessons from LeapFrog and Knowledge Universe. The lessons are, are kind of similar to what I said earlier. Don't believe the experts. Be bold in what you're doing. Do education right. Make it fun. Make great educational products fun. Have a real learning path. Again, the hardware software model is kind of consistent through almost everything I've, I've done. And uh, own your own space at retail and accelerate your online efforts, which we did in the, in the, in the mid-90s and have a strategy that others can't easily copy. Or in my opinion, if you have a strategy that others can copy easily, you don't have a strategy. So quickly, <clears throat> I was asked by the CEO of Gazillion to get back in the video game business. So I'm back in the video game business. I'm chairman of Gazillion. Again, the experts say, why are you doing this? Gazillion's not going to be successful. They've invested all this money in PC game. It's been OK. But it's not going to be successful. I said, no, I think, I think you're wrong. We're moving to free-to-play. We're moving to consoles. 
and I think we're going to be successful. And so we have launched, uh, I shouldn't say we have launched, we are about to launch on PS4 and Xbox next month, Marvel Heroes Omega. It's a big, beautiful game. It's in beta right now, closed beta, so some of you might have had a chance to play it. Uh, the audience for Marvel, of course, is enormous. Marvel is the number one IP in the world. It's a very, uh, very pr it can be a very profitable and very large game. Uh, we believe we're going to get 70 million in, in profit over the next, uh, the next five years. The free-to-play console market is, a, is new. The most console businesses pay it, pay for, a, pay for a disc or pay online. And we're free-to-play, and obviously you then, we will monetize through additional purchases, additional costumes. Everybody wants a new Spider-Man costume. Everybody wants a new Deadpool costume or weapon or what have you. And so we'll monetize in that way. And Marvel, by the way, seems to have been very cautious about their, their licensing, and so we think we're in good shape there. Um, the, in the PC world, the game has done very, very well. And in the console world, the Omega version of what we had before is, is brand new. There's a l great, great new artwork, great new storylines, great new characters, great new uh, uh, enemies to fight, so the, an awful lot of it is new. And you also can play on your couch against your son, or you can play online against a whole lot of other people. So it's a, it's a big, big, big RPG, RPG game. Very improved, uh, great, great gameplay in, in my, my opinion. And let's see if this works. Can we, pl can we play that video? I guess not. All right. Um, overall lessons, don't believe the experts solve a real big problem, hire and surround yourself with a great team. I used I way too much, it was never me, it was always, I have a fantastic team of people that I'm very close to to this day, from the Mattel days, from the Sega days, from the LeapFrog days, uh, all, we're all very close and get together frequently. And have great advisors, have somebody who can bounce your ideas off who share your vision. Get rid of the naysayers fast, I think that was mentioned earlier today by, by Menlo. And have a strategy others can't copy. Be bold. Tell an interesting story. Celebrate failure. We celebrated our, our failures, so long as they were for a good reason. I think VCs do that well, too. When they've invested for a good reason, it doesn't work out. Hey, it's not so bad. They learn something, and we celebrate our failures. I think that's the end of my time. Do I have time for questions, or should I end it here? Who's, who's monitoring me? Hi, I'm Ben from Long Short Stories. And uh, it seemed like you had a lot of great guerrilla marketing uh, tactics, even though you were working with such huge brands. I was wondering what of those uh, tactics, even though you say don't let your strategies be copyable, that a small s startup team could use with their... Yeah. Well, I, I think actually at, at, at Sega, we were being outspent 10 to 1 by Nintendo. So some of the things we did didn't cost much money. Having a college kid on each college campus really didn't cost much money. It was really just providing them with free software. Doing these mall tours where we'd set up in a mall across the country really didn't cost much money as marketing. We were the first to sponsor rock concerts back in those days. Rock concerts had a, a tough time getting other companies other than Pepsi or Coca-Cola to, to, to sponsor them. So we were the first that, that did that as, as well. Uh, believe it or not, we were the first to sponsor um, uh, music videos on, uh, on different music channels on, on television. So, and by the way, the internet didn't exist then, so we couldn't have done internet marketing. We couldn't do social marketing. We had to do it a different way. So I think all of the guerrilla marketing tactics that we used really, really worked well for us. Um, the idea of my, my guys and I walking past or driving past that, that, that strip mall and saying, hey, let's rent that store and put up a big sign, that probably was worth three, four hundred million dollars of business to us. So things like that. Hi, Tom. <laughs> Name is Ralph McCarr. A great presentation. I'd like to ask about the 
the future applications of gaming. For example, you talked about education. There's also hand-eye hand coordination for military running drones, the yep. protein folding problem for scientists. But there are many ways, healthcare. But if you yep. could talk about some of those, I'd be interested in kind of the future of gaming. Yeah, sure. Well, as, as you heard me talk, I still, and, and by the way, most of my activities today, I'm involved in ed tech companies still. I mean, I am chairman of Gazillion, but I'm also chairman of Global Education Learning. I'm on the board of Cambium Learning Group, where we're using uh, gameplay to make science and math fun and interesting. Uh, I'm on the board of Lightnir, which is uh, founded by the founder of Rovio, actually, Angry Birds, uh, Peter Vesterbach, who has a PhD in physics, and his, his employee number 10, Lori Jarvietto, has a PhD in, in chemistry. And they're determined they can make learning particle physics as fun and interesting as a video game. And I've got the beta of it on my phone, and, and it's pretty good. It's getting there. It's, it's gonna, we're all going to become particle physicists. Uh, who would have thought? Uh, and, and next they'll attack chemistry, and then after that some of the other, some of the other sciences. So in the area of using video game technology in education, I still deeply believe in. I, we're, I, I believe deeply in using more AI to be able to personalize curriculum for kids. Uh, so if, I think there's a booth out here where somebody is doing something similar to this. If you have a, a uh, middle schooler who hates math and hates the idea of having to learn algebra, but he loves cars, we today should be able to, to deliver algebra curricula to him in a car paradigm. And, and, and that's the kinds of things that I'm, I'm interested in doing. In, in AR, you, you may be aware that the first thing that John Hankey actually did when he left Google and went to Niantic was a, a, an educational game called Field Trip, where you took your, your he, he filmed uh, the monuments in Washington, D.C., New York, San Francisco, and when you took your smartphone and you held it up to that monument, your phone would talk to you and tell you who the, when that, that monument was built, who the architect was, and a little bit of history about it. So those kinds of things for, for learning, using AR in that fashion for learning, I think is, is very important. VR as well, although it's further away because it's still so expensive, but I saw a VR education. I've seen several VR applications that are, that are really terrific. One I saw was for EMT training, where you had your helmet on, obviously, and all of a sudden there's a body in front of you and a voice in your headset says, I'm a doctor. Uh, you've got to save this patient. He's just had a stroke. There's a table and there's syringes and tubes on it and there's an MRI screen and the doctor says, you have five minutes to save his life. Insert the syringe into his femoral artery. Now take the pink tube and put it in where you st put the syringe. Stick that pink tube up through his heart. Now attach the green tube, put it from his heart up to his brain. You have 30 seconds left to save his life. Attach the, the suction cup and suck that blood clot back out of his brain. Sorry, you just killed the patient. That's pretty exciting stuff. I was sweating, you know. I, you think like you're really, really engaged in that activity. And it's, it's such better learning because you're, you're getting to fail and the guy isn't really dying, you know. <laughs> and, and it's certainly better uh, training than doing that kind of thing on a, on a cadaver. So I see a lot of u the uses of AR and VR in, in different areas of, of training. EMT is an easy one. Nursing is an easy one. Uh, I saw a VR uh, training for, for astronomy class uh, back at the University of Wisconsin recently. It was really good. I never cared about astronomy. After playing that game, I cared about astronomy. So a lot of that kind of stuff. Hi, Tom. Uh, my name is Al Myers. I'm with Ty Atlanta, but previously, 15 years ago, I was one of the founders of GameTap, which you probably are aware oh, yeah. of. So yeah. I have two questions for you. Um, you've been very public, you know, about the direction that Sega has taken. So, um, how are they doing? And can they? Can they? Are, is it working? That's number one. The second question is, from an entrepreneur's point of view, how does an entrepreneur succeed in making a games company? Yeah. So. Uh Actually, I wasn't very vocal because after I left Sega, I was so busy doing these 36 different companies, I didn't pay much attention to what uh, Sega was doing. I mean, I did, I was vocal at the beginning. I thought the, the whole launch of Saturn was a mistake. It should have been held off and it should have been a better system. We wanted more internet conductivity in it. Dreambox, I didn't have much to, to do with. Uh, so I wasn't too critical until I started seeing some of the Sonic games and I, that followed our games. I thought all of the Sonic games, I mean, this is easy when you're the 
part of the team that did it, you of course think the things you did were better. Uh, but I had the same opinion voiced to me by a lot of other people who played Sonic games afterwards. So I think there was a period of time when the Sonic games weren't, weren't very good. I think they're getting back on, on the right track now. Uh, uh, the Sega organization is a mystery to me. I mean, it's, it's crazy. I mean, it's, you got Atlas down in Orange County. You've got Sega Networks in San Francisco. You've got what would be Sega of America in Burbank that just seems to do licensing. And it's not all together any longer. So it's a very difficult management structure. So I have been critical uh, about that. Uh, getting, getting started in the video game business, and obviously with the cost of console games and PC games, it's, it's hard. But the mobile area, I think, is a great, is a great area. And the costs are not that, that terrific. I mean, if you, if you look at what King did with, with Candy Crush, I mean, it really was columns only with candy characters on it. So they took an old, an old successful product and updated it with new graphics and new thoughts. And I don't think it cost them that much to, to really hit a home run with that one and obviously get, eventually get a very high, high valuation. So I think I'd go after that area uh, first. Uh, anyway, I, I see I'm out of time. I hope I answered the question. Oh, one more? OK. I can't hear. Yeah. We do see that there's a lot of opportunity, and of course, there's a lot of competition as well. And yes. uh, because the barriers to entry have lowered, and the costs of user acquisition have, you know, really skyrocketed, right? So, if you were to start a mobile gaming company today, you know, what are the things that you will do to, yeah, and and without the backing of a big brand, how will you go about doing your Gorilla marketing and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I'm not a social marketing expert. Uh, and, I, and obviously, that's where my kids spend all of their time. So I think you've got to be, you've got to be important into, uh, into the social marketing world. Uh, and I think you've got to have something a little outrageous that stands out and gets the attention. I mean, if you think about it, when we were successful in the past, Nobody ever seen a character on screen move as fast as Sonic the Hedgehog did. Nobody had seen real blood in a console video game as they did in Mortal Kombat with us. So we did some outrageous things that got us a lot of attention, uh, and particularly for the, the teen and college market, which, which is a great place, I think, for, for video games. You, you'd, have to, you'd have to do something a little bit very different there uh, in that world. But, I, I still think the, some of the guerrilla marketing things that we did in the past still would work, you know, on college campuses and rock concerts and in, although nobody's going to malls anymore, I guess you'd have to do it on Amazon somehow. But, but anyway, th those, sorts of, those sorts of activities. One? Okay. One last one. Uh, thank you for your amazing in advice and insights today. Um, so I'm a student at NYU and a startup entrepreneur in the EdTech space. And my question was that how are you and your associates at the ed tech companies that you work with uh, looking at education technology in the developing countries? So, so in the sense that digital education for the next billion, uh, how are you thinking about that? Uh, and is there any presence of the entrepreneurs that you're working with in yeah. places in South Asia or Africa? And how is that different? Yeah. Uh, well, and by, and by the way, global education learning was very involved in, in China in uh, answering mom's questions about education and involved in English language education. Um, and the, one of the companies that I'm on the board of, Lightnir, just launched actually in Singapore and is very interested in launching in, in uh, India and China as well because the problem is the same. Well, students hear the word particle physics and they say, oh my God, that's hard. I don't want to take that course. So the whole idea of the particle physics game, which is called Big Bang Legends, is not to make them experts in physics, but to get them comfortable and interested in it and to see that it's not overwhelming and that they can do it and that they can get started in it so that they can progress. And the same is true with the, with the math games the, and the algebra games I've been involved with uh, uh, and other science games through Explore Learning that I've been, uh, been involved with. It's not to necessarily make you an expert. It's to get you going so that you're not afraid of it. And all of that is applicable around the world. Uh, so hopefully we will get to, well, we're, we, in the case of Lightner, we're already Singapore. I know they want to do India. I know they want to do China. So we'll see how quickly they can, they can do those markets. Thank you.